we start. Yep. So I'm happy, happy to welcome people back. Um, we next have uh, Yoshi Tachikawa's third lecture on uh, uh, <clears throat> topological phases and relativistic quantum field theories. All right. Thank you very much for coming back. Um, yesterday I had a very huge dinner and I just had a lot for lunch. I couldn't resist muscles provided the <laughs> cafeteria and uh, most of my blood is around the stomach and I cannot really think. So let's see how it goes. Um, yesterday, we, I, I talked about the relation, I mean how to understand anomaly in 0 plus 1D and corresponding 1 plus 1D SPT for finite group, finite group G. And I said that that's given by this group, cohomology group, uh, H2G of U1. So today I'd like to generalize this observation to various directions. So what kind of generalizations can you think of? One obvious generalization is to change the dimension, increase the space-time dimensions. So let me just tell you the answer. I mean, d-dimensional anomaly and uh, d plus 1d SPT for finite group G is characterized by uh, h d plus 1 of the same cohomology group. So that's the first generalization. I will give you a bit more detail and some example for this case. So that's the first generalization. Also, uh, we can consider the following generalization. Um, so here, I basically only talked about the anomaly among the transformations in G, right? So this corresponds to, in some sense, a pure gauge anomaly, right? So you can generalize this to more general uh, gauge gravity with some scare quote anomalies and also corresponding higher one SPT in one higher dimension. So that's the second generalization. And the final generalizations I'd like to discuss today is the following. So here I discussed, I mean, yesterday I discussed uh, uh, G as a symmetry, right? But uh, recently, there's, uh, in, people introduced the generalization of the concept of a symmetry. So in this context, uh, this is called a zero form symmetry. I will explain the meaning of this zero form symmetry when the time comes. But once you have something called zero form symmetry, we can definitely generalize this to a more general P form symmetry. It's anomaly in, I mean, D dimensions and the corresponding SPT in d plus 1 dimensions. So these are the three generalizations I'd like to discuss today. So I thought I would spend about 20 minutes for each. So let's see how it goes. Um, maybe I might need 30 minutes for each. In that case, I will discuss the last part uh, tomorrow. So um, I can discuss, so let me start with this generalization. Of course, I can uh, discuss the very general case of general D, right? But that's rather cumbersome. First of all, I don't know how to draw, I mean, high dimensional space time on the blackboard. So let me just discuss the simplest, uh, I mean, the next example. So we already discussed 1 plus 1D anomaly and 1 plus, sorry, 0 plus 1D anomaly and 1 plus 1D SPT. 
Instead, let's discuss uh, anomaly in 2D. and the corresponding 3D SBT for finite G. So let's start. So we consider some 2D spacetime, right? And we'd like to consider some G bundle on it. And the way I represent a G bundle on this 2D spacetime up on, in this patch, a certain patch of the 2D spacetime is as before, as just as yesterday. So I represent them as a junction, a network of domain walls, each representing some action of the group element. So let me remind you what this particular line means. So if you are living here, and if you cross this domain wall, then you experience this transformation by a group element G. So you become G acted on U, right? So that's how you read it. And uh, as I said, basically the same G bundle can be represented in multiple ways using these domain wall junctions. So. One way is to have G, H, K, first merging G and H, and then merging G, K, right? So let's say we have this figure in a certain patch. But you can represent basically the same G bundle by merging the domain walls in the opposite order. So first merging H and K, and then you merge G. Right? So if this two-dimensional theory you are considering does not have any anomaly, uh, these two figures should produce the same number, right? But here we consider the case where this system has an anomaly, right? So you allow the possibility that the figure on the right-hand side is in fact not quite the same. They are only the same up to a certain phase in U1. So let's see what kind of consistency condition is required. So it's like a finite version of the Vesuvino uh, consistency condition. So what happens is this. things become increasingly more complicated as the dimensions grow. So please bear with me. Now, suppose you have four domain walls represented by G, H, and K, L. And let's perform this kind of move in two different ways. So you can first change this part, right? And then you can. move this way, but uh, this final figure can be obtained by performing instead the following moves. So we first, you first uh, change this left-hand side, and then you move, exchange this part as follows, right. And then you finally make a modification like this, right? So let's see what kind of phases you get. So if you remember the phase, it's a, a bit unreadable there, but uh, you can check that the phase produced here is C, G, H, K, L, because we, if, when you go from here to there, we mo perform a modification around here. So here you have G, H, and K, and L, and that's the phase we associated. And then you get G, H, comma, K, L, 
on this side. Uh, so on the lower side, of course, this is the basic move, which produces C, G, H, and K. And in, in this bottom place, you have C, G, H, K, and L. And the final thing is C, H, K, and L, right? So although we said that the local move might produce uh, this phase, um, we still require that the a given picture, a given domain wall, gives you a specific number. Therefore, the phase you obtained by performing this two operation should be equal to the phase you obtained by the three moves we did here. So you just require the following consistency condition divided by C, G, H, K, C, G, H, K, L, C, H, K, L, and you require this to be one. But if you re read the lecture, uh, I mean the note you took yesterday, this happens to be exactly the action, I mean, what's obtained by acting this differential C and evaluate it on these four variables. Therefore, uh, this means that the anomaly in 2D is characterized, characterized by uh, H3, uh, G, U1. Um, I didn't explain why I should identify two Cs differing by a co-boundary, but uh, you can um, do that. So, so this is a fact, right? I have a question. Yes, please. This looks exactly like uh, the compactification of the modular space of a punctured disk, mm -hmm. or a infinity relations. This uh, it's, is it's, it's basically the same. Same thing. Yeah. yeah, the same equations appear everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, this is standard pentagon equation, right. yes. Right. So let me next explain that this gauge variation, this anomaly can be canceled by coupling to a 3D bulk specified by the same element, right? Yesterday, uh, I discussed that, oh, it's not yesterday, I mean, two days ago, we discussed that uh, projective representation is characterized by H2, and it, its projective phase can be accounted for by coupling a two-dimensional theory uh, specified by that group, uh, group cohomology. Here, I'm just um, raising the space-time dimensions by, oops, by one. But what is going on is just basically formally the same. Um, so I'm not going to explain the details. You can convince yourself by carefully working out I mean, how to generalize uh, discussion from the day before yesterday to one, oops, one higher dimensions. So what you need to do what you do is the following. So you imagine that your 2D theory lives on a boundary of a three-dimensional bulk. Right? Suppose you now have some domain wall network for this group action. So what you do is to think of this domain wall in 2D as a the boundary of the domain wall network in the bulk 3D. Um, my drawing ability is very bad, so I would like to ask you to imagine what is going on 
in the bulk <laughs> this moment. So here I have one wall, and I have another wall, right? And then I have the third wall. I mean, the third wall, and they intersect among the 3D bulk. So how do you account for this phase using this kind of fixture, right, so it's, it's set up. So what you want to do is the following. I mean, now, suppose you have this junction on the boundary, right? And you would like to connect this picture with the other picture you have, right? So that's exactly this picture and the other picture. So in order to connect these two pictures, you imagine some kind of an animation of a 2D plane, which slowly changes as you go inside the bulk, right? So you start from this expression, I mean this graph, and you imagine that this connection point comes close to the, the other junction point as you go inside the bulk, right? And at, po at some point, you have four walls meeting at a point. And then you continue further and you end up with the other configuration. So unfortunately, I don't have the ability to I mean, nicely present the figure of how these four walls are intersecting in the bulk, but please use your imagination to think what is going on. And it is clear that in this one point in the bulk, you have four walls, right, <laughs> representing G, H, and K merging into the wall uh, representing G, H, K, right? So the point is that you assign a face C, G, H, K to such a junction, and this accounts for the phase you have when you move uh, domain wall junctions on the boundary. So what happens is that the 3D theory is specified by C by the same C, and the partition function in 3D is obtained by multiplying by all junction points in the bulk like this. And such a junction point is always labeled by three elements, and you just multiply C, G, H, and K. And just as we saw two days ago, um, the condition which is up there, which you cannot see of this uh, closedness under the uh, group cohomology differential guarantees that this three-dimensional partition function is invariant under the change in the shape, change in the way the domain walls are connected as long as they always represent the same G bundle in the 3D. However, if you have a boundary, there's a certain phase you can introduce and that is take, taken into account by the anomaly. So this, this is how the relation between the group cohomology and anomaly and SPT phase generalizes to a general space-time dimensions. So this is a extremely a general. So let me just discuss one example. So what would be the simplest system with anomaly in two dimensions? 
So in one plus one, sorry, in, for zero plus one dimensions, uh, Zn didn't have any anomaly, unfortunately. But happily, in three dimensions, I mean, even the Z2 has an anomaly. This is, in fact, Z2. So let's say Z2 is labeled by 0 and 1. So we need to assign some numbers, GHK, right, satisfying that condition. And uh, the way, so let's consider the non-trivial element, which is given by 1 when G is H is K is 1, and 0 when everything is, when otherwise. You can check that this indeed give, uh, satisfies the condition up there. And uh, in pictorial representation is this. Because this is Z2, if you have two Z2 non-trivial elements, they fuse into trivial elements. So you have trivial line. I mean, identity line is basically is having no line at all. So you can write this diagram. So what happens is that if you do this mo small modification in the way the group, sorry, in the G bundle is represented, you get the minus sign. So this is the anomaly of Z2 theory. So is there any 2D theory which has this anomaly? Um, in fact, if you consider a level K, SU2, versus the Mino Witte model. Uh, this has a Z2 symmetry associated to uh, sending G to minus G. I mean, SU2 has this obvious symmetry. And uh, it is known that this Z2 symmetry is anomalous, non-anomalous, and anomalous uh, according to whether, sorry, whether K, whether K is even or not. So, one way to see that's the case is as follows. I can just erase this thing. Um, so there are various ways to study versus amino with the models. Um, but the one way to use CFT description CFT description, and uh, so the point is this Zumino with the model at level K has SU2K left moving current algebra and SU2K right moving current algebra. And uh, there's a chiral primary operator for each spin, starting from 1, 0, 1 half, da, 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 up to k over 2. So the effect of the level is to truncate the number of primaries. And uh, if you take the tensor product of two primaries, they basically follow the standard um, tensor product law of SU2. So use start from the lowest dimension thing, and uh, you get the next one up to j plus j prime for ordinary SU2. But in the affine algebra case, there's a certain maximum imposed. 
if the sum is too big, it is reflected back. So this is the uh, result. And one thing you can check using this uh, tensor multiplication law is that the top line, top, top primary, if you tensored with itself, then this corresponds, this becomes just a identity primary. And in, in general, in 2D CFT, um, if you have a primary, you can do the following. So on, a, on some point on the world sheet, you create you create this uh, this pair, a pair of these operators using this group law. So you start from an identity operator and you split into two. And you move them around, and you suppose you can have you can have a hole, and you go around, and you merge them together. So this way, from a chiral primary operator, you can define a line operator. Can define line operator. And in this particular case of SU two versus the Mino Witten model. Uh, this is just, I mean, Wilson line. Wilson line in, I mean, spin k over two representation. Um, but because of this <laughs> squaring property, uh, this line operator behaves as if uh, it's a Z2 domain wall. And you can check that, in fact, I mean, this Z2 domain wall exactly does what this uh, action does to the element of SU2. But the important point is that spin K over two representation is pseudo real or strictly real, depending on whether K is odd or K is even. Therefore, what happened is that, uh, I mean, well, when you glue two Z2 line to form uh, identity line, you need to use epsilon symbols in this case. So this gives you various minus signs, which eventually reproduces this uh, anomalous phase you would see in this case. Anyway, uh, the end result is that Z2 gauging Anyway, the end result is that Z2 gauging or OB folding of SU2K versus uh, Minowitten is possible only for even K. And in this case, if when you obifold the theory, what you get is something called uh, D-type uh, invariant, modular invariant of SU2K. Yep. Yes. 
Um, so when, when you fuse two lines, um, so in the case of k, k, k equals one, these are Wilson lines in the doublet representations, right? So you need to use epsilon a, b. Well, this doesn't quite explain why you get this minus one sign, right? I, I perfectly understand that. So that's, there's a tricky issue um, which I didn't carefully explain. So in fact, um, when I discuss these things, you need to assign a direction, local direction, to every domain wall operator. And the main issue uh, producing this minus sign is, is that, uh, I mean, you know that if you have two epsilon AVs fused together, you get minus one, right? So, so, so at some point, in order to map this computation to the rule of assignment of the arrows, which I don't have time to carefully explain, at one point you need to use the fact that if you have a doublet representation going on with two insertions of the epsilon symbol, you get minus one. So that eventually uh, produces mi minus one sign. Um, that's one way to see it. Uh, another way to see it is to just compute the uh, 6J symbol uh, for this um, affine SU2K current algebra. And that's exactly what appears here. So in that case, you just go through the whole computation of the 6J, quantum 6J symbol for arbitrary SU2K with arbitrary representation, and you restrict that to the case of a top spin operator, and you find that the um, sign is really minus one to, uh, I mean, sign is minus one and K is odd, and sign is plus one when K is even. Yeah. I don't know how to easily see the minus sign, but eventually it boils down to the fact that uh, for K is odd, the top representation is pseudo real. Yeah. Sorry, I don't have a really intuitive explanation, and thank you for the question. So, so again, this fact that you can only perform this Z2 gauging to, to obtain D type invariant for K even is a well known fact. Uh, long known fact from the 80s, and, but uh, now we are seeing it as a manifestation of the possible anomaly of the Z2 symmetry of this Vesu uh, Zeminowitten model. So that's what this, I mean, slightly new insight, new viewpoint coming from the condensed matter science provides us. So of course this is a known story, but we just identify why there is this additional problem when K is odd. So that's for the generalization of the pure, the pure anomaly. So let me next discuss what happens in the case of a mixed anomaly, right? So I'm still, I'm going to still talk about just uh, two-dimensional theory because that's the simplest case where you can see various phenomena easily. And I will come back to a very simple system we started, I started this 
Next surveys. So uh, let's consider one plus one D, a fermion system. But this time, I consider non chiral and Majorana. Right? So I have psi L and psi R. So what kind of symmetry does it have? So there is a, so now I'm co not considering the complex fermion we discussed in the first day of the lecture, but instead I'm considering real fermions. So, so there are various ways to say the, syst the symmetry of the system. So the system can couple to couple to, of course, the spin structure. And Z to background the field. And I assign this Z2 background field so that it couples only to, say, psi r. So it's a chiral Z2 symmetry. But uh, I can declare that this spin structure coupled to both. So this is one way to say that. Another slightly different but equivalent way to say that is that the system can couple to I mean, spin structure for psi L, and another different spin structure prime for psi R. So difference of two spin structures are just a Z2 gauge field. So these two things are equivalent, but uh, they, they are two different ways of expressing things. So you can ask, what kind of anomaly this system has, right? Can we, so, so, so to distinguish, let's say this is a diagonal spin structure, right? So can we gauge diagonal spin structure? Does anybody know the answer? So by gauging spin structures, you you mean that you just sum over all diagonal spin structures. So if you can, if, if it's possible to sum over the spin structure, this means that there's no anomaly in this spin structure. And the answer to this is yes. This has been known for a long time. And what you have is that if you sum over the diagonal spin structure of this Majorana fermion, non chiral Majorana fermion theory, you get Ising model. Get. So um, in your statistical mechanics course, uh, it, probably you have learned that uh, you can solve the 2D Ising model exactly, and that is the final result is represented by Major and Fermion on the same 2D surface. But th that statement, that sentence is not completely precise because the definition of the 2D Ising model doesn't require any spin structure on the Riemann surface or, or on the 2D surface. However, uh, the definition of a major and a fermion requires, do require, uh, specification of the spin structure. So the precise statement is that the low energy limit, the continuum limit of the standard Ising model is a spin structure summed version of the uh, non-chiral major and a fermion theory on, in 2D. And the fact that this statement makes sense means that, in fact, there's no anomaly in this spin structure. I mean this diagonal spin structure. So next you can ask the question, can we gauge uh, chiral spin structure? 
And the answer is no. No, you can't. So there is an anomaly in this chiral spin structure or the equivalent to chiral Z2 symmetry. So let me explain why that's the case. So let me try this time erasing this board and bringing it up. And uh, let's see. Yeah, I need to practice more how to organize this better. Um, so let's hope that uh, this thing dries up when I bring it down next time. And uh, I still need to erase this. Right, so let's see how, what goes wrong if you try to couple non-trivial background field. So let's put the two-dimensional theory on a circle, and let's say that chiral Z2 has a minus one monodromy. What does that mean? This means that if psi L is periodic, then psi R is antiperiodic. So this, is, this means that the system in the RNS sector in the language of uh, string theorist, right? So let's remind ourselves what was the vacuum energy in this case? I mean, NS sector vacuum has this L0, and the R sector, let's say, has this L0 bar. Therefore, um, the spin Therefore, the spin, or P, of the vacuum is, I mean, L0 minus L0 bar is, I mean, plus minus 1 over 16, right? But this is kind of wrong. Why that's the case? So. The point is, I mean, P exponential of IP corresponds to 2 pi rotation of the circle, I mean, 2 pi P, right? So well, we are talking about spin theory, which can have fermions. So, but uh, I mean, 2 pi rotation of fermion at the most can produce the phase minus one. Therefore, this needs to be plus minus one. This means that P is, at the most, P is integer or half integer, right? But we just found 1 16th. So this means that if you try to compute the partition function, of this system on the, not, not on the cylinder, but on the torus, you get a phase ambiguity, which is the eighth, eighth root uh, of unity. Therefore, you found a certain anomaly. So the anomaly is Z, Z8. So you, you, if there are eight copies 
of this system, the whole setup. I mean, L0 minus L0 bar is one half, and no anomaly. And then you can gauge, or equivalently sum over, a spin structure for psi L and a spin structure for psi R independently. Uh, this operation of summing over spin structures for both left movers and right movers independently is known as the GSO, chiral GSO projection. And we just learned that this chiral GSO projection is only possible when there is, uh, I mean, the number of non-chiral Majorana fermion is multiple of eight, right? Does this sound familiar? Um, when we learned perturbative string theory, um, somehow during the long argument leading to the construction of the type two, piece, type two strings, you learn how to do this GSO projection, right? But we don't learn the fact that this GSO projection is only possible in when there are, I mean, the, when the number, only when the number of Majorana fermions is multiple over eight. Um, here, in order to directly compare with this, you need to take the light cone gauge. So this means that the total di dimensions of the space time need to be two or 10 or 18, etc. So this gives you an additional constraint on the consistency of the superstrings theory, which, well, we know from the cancellation of the central charge, we know that the space-time dimension for type two needs to be 10, right? But if the mathematics is such that GSO projection is not possible, I mean, so th there's some mysterious connection that this anomaly is a Z8 anomaly. So this is something you can appreciate once when you learn this uh, new point of view about the anomaly uh, of a discrete symmetry Z2, uh, which is kind of a mixed anomaly between the spin structure and the Z2. Okay. So, from the general discussion I've been doing, uh, I guess I should have erased that and wrote it up, but anyway. Um, so from the general discussion, we expect that this anomaly can be accounted for by a symmetric protected topological phase in one higher dimensions. So what is the corresponding SPT in 2 plus 1D? So let me discuss a general uh, situation. So such an SPT should assign to a manifold plus spin structure a number, right? Such that they behave naturally and uh, I mean, suppose you have two manifolds, then I'd like the partition function to satisfy something like this, such that, again, this is a manifold with spin structure, and in the case of Z, if you also have Z2 gauge field, you need to specify certain type of data, right? So how do we think of, how should we think of this partition function? So a standard mathematical trick is to first consider, so the trick is,
consider the whole set, set of, in our case, I mean 3D spin manifold with Z2 bundle on it, right? So let's consider this whole zoo of manifold with spin structure and Z2 gauge field. And then let's identify, identify them under small deformations. Right? And furthermore, I mean, introduce addition. on this quotient by this gluing, gluing together. So this is not really the correct mathematical definition, but you understand that, at least you can see that, you can introduce such a mathematical object, right? You consider the whole zoo of the manifold, you perform some identifications, and you introduce a additive group structure. And this gives us something called, this is just a notation. So this is called Cobordism's group. So this three means that you are considering 3D manifold. This, this superscript spin means that you are considering spin manifold, and I don't have time to explain why I've put B here, but this Z2 means that you have Z2 gauge bundle on it, and this is an additive group, right? So once we introduce this uh, group, which then this condition, means that Z is a homomorphism from omega spin three BZ two to U one. Right? It turns out that well mathematicians kindly computed this complicated object, so there, are, there is a subfield of mathematics called algebraic topology, and they computed this, and because this is Z8, you see that uh, such a 3D SPT is characterized, is also given by Z8. And uh, Majorana fermion, I mean 2D non-chiral Majorana fermion corresponds to the generator of this class. So, oops. So that's the generalization of the group cohomology you need in the case of spin structure. So let me end today's lecture by discussing various other uh, Cobordism groups. So let's see if I can write a big table. Um, so, right. So let's say D is so we are discussing omega D spin of B Z two. Right? But before discussing that, uh, you sh we should have discussed the pure spin anomaly, right? 
not with, in relation with uh, Z2. So in this case, because you don't have Z2, you just don't write anything. So th that's the thing. So this is the group obtained by just considering these dimensional spin manifold and identifying them up to small deformations and introducing group structure. And you can consider D1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. And uh, this is Z2. Uh, this is Z2. This is 0. This is Z, dot, dot, dot. And it turns out that this is Z2 times Z2. This is also Z2 times Z2. And I told you that this is Z8. And you have Z, dot, dot, dot. So you just ask your algebraic topologist friend, what are these groups? And they tell you this. But uh, let's uh, try to understand what they are, right? So each entry here has two interpretations, as I am emphasizing. So, they, so this entry can be thought of either as two-dimensional, very trivial theory with just one-dimensional Hilbert space so that the partition function is a phase. This, the same entry can also mean the type of anomaly, mixed anomaly or pure anomaly with the spin and the symmetry in one dimension lower. So we just discussed, in some sense, the most complicated entry in this whole <laughs> table I just wrote. So this Z8 means, corresponded to the fact that, well, in three dimensions, there is a certain uh, SPT phase which takes this value. But from the two-dimensional point of view, this meant that the chiral GSO projection is possible only when you have uh, eight times integer number of Majorana fermions. So that fact can be easily seen by looking at the table. So that's what it is. But I should have said that before even talking about that, I should have told, discussed this entry zero, I mean, which means a trivial group. This means that, I mean, in two dimensions, you can always perform the sum over spin structure without encountering the anomaly. So that might have, that fact might look to you something trivial, but in fact it is not. For, for dimension, in fewer dimensions, there are theories which couples to spin structure, which is anomalous under just the spin structure, so that you cannot sum over the spin structure. That's what you can see from this, this table. Um, so let's discuss what this Z2 is, right? So this is an SPT, 1 plus 1D spin SPT. And uh, which somehow assigns assigns Z2. So what is that? What is that? Um, I cannot, I don't have the time, well, I'm running out of time, so I don't have the time, but uh, uh, in the case of the torus, you know what are the possible spin structures. So you can have NS, NS, then, I mean, automatically this side is R, etc. But there's one special spin structure where you have R's periodic sector on both sides, and the diagonal direction is also R sector. So this non-trivial SPT assigns plus one to these cases and assigns minus one to the other case. So this is called a, a parity evenness or I mean parity of the spin structure. This is called odd spin structure. This is called even spin structure. And this is Z2 distinguishes them. So 
This is, in a sense, a discrete torsion for the spin structure. So suppose, suppose you are given, say you have 2D spin theory Q, right? You can sum over over the spin structure. So you get a certain non-spin theory because you summed over a spin structure, you get a theory which doesn't care about the spin structure. But there's another way to sum over spin structure. So you consider Q, but then you insert this non-trivial SPT. You add, you add this SPT. So this is a two-dimensional theory coupled to spin structure, so you can add it. And then you can sum over spin structure. So starting from a two-dimensional spin theory, there are in fact two ways to perform the sum over the spin structure. And in the string theory literature, this is known as the 0A uh, GSO projection, and this is known as the 0B uh, GSO projection. So this entry, Z2, tells you that in fact, the, uh, tells you that, I mean, some other reason why the two possible, I mean, there are two non-chiral uh, GSO projections possible. And similarly, this Z2 times Z2 class classifies all possible uh, phases you can introduce when you sum over uh, left-moving spin structure and the right-moving spin structures independently. So, so in fact, if you start from the standard NSR super string world sheet, there are four different, uh, non sorry, four different chiral uh, GSO projections. Uh, if you read Polchinski's textbooks, indeed he says um, <laughs> there are four versions, but nobody talks about four different uh, type two string theories, right? There are just type two A and type two B. So what happens is that um, what happens is that this Majorana fermion theory on the Riemann surface happens to have the, sa the same left mover and the right mover. It is parity symmetric, right? Therefore, b because of that, I mean, four among the four possible GSO projections, two and another two gives the same answer in the end. So if you start from a non-symmetric non 2D CFT, 2D spin CFT, which has different left mover and the right mover combined to form a CFT, then when you do the uh, chiral GSO projection, there are four distinct uh, methods possible. So that's this Z2 times Z2. Um, yeah. So let, let me fi fi end today's lecture by just discussing this Z2, right? So it's a very uh, trivial way to end the lecture. So if you have a circle with a spin structure, of course you have a periodic spin structure and the anti-periodic spin structure. So that's this Z2. So in that way, um, you can slowly understand it, what these entries mean. And uh, if you uh, reread string theory textbooks uh, or all the papers on 2D CFTs, uh, after learning this table, you see that the same thing appears in various guises uh, in various places, and this gives you a somewhat unified viewpoint uh, about this. Thank you very much. I think we can wait for the discussion session. You have? The chairman is allowed to ask stupid questions, but... Um, please, please, uh, go there's, ahead. There's, uh, there's a piece of language that I was wondering if I was going to hear from you, which is PIN. Ah, yes. And is there a relation between what you're doing and the, and the PIN group structures? Yes. Um, well, un unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about the PIN structure, but PIN structure is... Ah. So, 
we know that in the, uh, the rotation group, there are orthogonal group and the S -O special orthogonal group. So this preserves the orientation. This not necessarily preserves the spin structure. We know that SO has a double cover, which is the spin group, right? So a mathematician decided that the double cover, which governs the fermion on non-orientable manifold, to be the pin group by dropping this S. So if you want to really think about uh, what happens to, I mean, if you want to consider anomalies of theories under orientation reversal, and if that theory has fermions, then you need to d extend this discussion to the cobordism group with pin structure, etc. Yeah. So if you want to understand why a type one world sheet is okay, why you can gauge the orientation reversal if you have eight Majorana and fermion, you need to study the pink cobordism group, and you can understand the various subtle phases in the um, construction of type one from that point of view. Yeah.